everyone. My name is uh, Maurice Proteski. I'm a veterinarian and cooperative extension specialist at the UC Davis School of Veterinary Medicine. Um, I focus on poultry health and food safety epidemiology. So um, I'm going to talk, I'm going to use uh, a lot of Dr. Gallardo slides and um, we're going to use those clickers um, and we're going to go through um, talking about disease transmission and, and practical biosecurity. Um, so does anyone know what biosecurity is? What's, a, what's a, just a general definition of biosecurity? What's that a fancy word for, basically? Yeah, so it's, it's basically we're, we're trying to, to exclude diseases from getting onto our farm, from getting into our birds. Um, so that's really, it's just a fancy word for just trying to exclude diseases from getting into our flock. Um, so just a fancy word for that. And I'm very informal, so um, if you have questions, feel free to ask them, um, either now, uh, after, or, or in the future. So kind of part of my job, and, and I spend a decent amount of time doing this all the time, is talking to backyard producers and farmers um, all over the state and, and beyond. So um, feel free to Google me or, or however you want to contact me and email me. I think one of the things I'm really keen on is uh, nine times out of ten, I will not know the answer to your question, but I know who does know the answer to your question. So um, I, I can connect the dots, hopefully, to the person that's going to be the most useful for you. So uh, even if you don't think that it's a, a question that I might not know, I usually um, pride myself on knowing who should know that, the answer to that. So uh, feel free to, to use me for that also. Um, so I just want to make you aware, I'm going to do a couple advertisements and just a couple things I want you to be aware of before we go talk about biosecurity. Um, but we have a pretty decent uh, website. So if you type in UC Davis and poultry, um, you'll get to our cooperative extension website. And um, there's a lot of different resources there. I'm going to just tell you about a few of them today. Uh, one is we have a newsletter that comes out quarterly called Poultry Ponderings. Um, so um, if you uh, go to that website, you can actually sign up for it, and it'll just auto send you all the, um, the new editions. But we have about 13 uh, editions, previous editions, that you can kind of search through. And the idea here is we're just trying to summarize what type of research and outreach events are available to you guys um, over uh, the last quarter at all the UCs, at all the University of California institutions that do anything related to poultry. So it's not just Davis. It's not just Riverside. Um, it's basically anything in the UC system that's related to poultry, any kind of outreach events, 4-H, et cetera, et cetera. So um, here you can see um, Dr. Murillo in action here with uh, her PhD advisor, Dr. Mullins. So um, they're looking at ectoparasites, of course, um, in backyard chickens in Los Angeles. And uh, they did a study um, that just basically looked at uh, the different types of ectoparasites that they saw in backyard chickens. And the nice part about poultry ponderings, in my mind, is if, you, if your subscription to the Journal of Medical Entomology ran out, uh, you don't need to renew it. Now you can just get the free copy of poultry ponderings and, and get a nice summary of the article. But if you want the really in-depth article, then you can reach out to Dr. Murillo, and she will tell you all the minutiae there. Uh, we've got cartoons in there. We've got you know, trivia in there. So um, hopefully it's useful to kind of a wide spectrum of folks. Um, and, and feel free to, 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 to utilize that. So um, you can just go on the website and you just put your email address in, then it'll just get auto sent to you every quarter. Um, the other thing is the cartoons. So um, uh, Monica mentioned that um, we're, we're, we're making a, a book, and that book is going to actually have cartoon characters in it, and it's going to try to teach all this poultry related stuff in hopefully a less dry way um, and have characters that are. Um, hopefully kind of silly. So I've got uh, someone, uh, a veterinarian I work with, who's a lot funnier than I am, uh, Dr. Evan Adler. And uh, he makes these cartoons for this newsletter and also is doing a lot of the cartooning for our book. Um, so if you can't read it, it says chicken dispenser, and it says chickens less than one year old, pull it. And then uh, chickens uh, older than one year old, uh, push it. Um, <laughs> So that actually should be 14 weeks or so. We edited a later version, but the, you get the idea. So I, I put the wrong version of it there. Um, and then before we go any further, I really wanted to thank uh, Monica and uh, Dr. Gallardo for organizing this. Um, as, as you guys probably know, and, and I certainly know, organizing these things is not trivial. It's, it's like planning a wedding each time, like multiple times a year. So um, I really wanted to thank 
um, them for all their efforts and organization. And this has been a, a really, um, it's great to participate in these type of things. Um, anyway, so that's one commercial I wanted to do. The other thing I wanted to advertise is we have this California backyard poultry census that Dr. Gallardo and I developed. Um, so it's a, uh, what's called a geo survey. And uh, it's, that's just a fancy word for you go on to, if you just Google California backyard poultry census, um, you can have in English or Spanish, you can fill out a five question survey. And what it does is it tells you, it, tells, it populates a map below this um, of where we have backyard poultry farms in California. This is not so I can share this with, you know, the CIA or anything like that. Um, it's basically just so let's say we had avian influenza in the Central Valley of California or we had an outbreak of um, infectious laryngeotracheitis or something in a really focal region. Well, now I can use this as a way to kind of communicate with um, people in those affected areas. Um, so we have over 600 people that have filled out this survey. Um, if you do the back of the envelope calculations, we have about 100,000 backyard poultry um, premises in the state. So my goal is to get to 1%, is to get to 1,000. Um, and that's a great, you know, through people's social networks, that 1,000 really expands to, if you look at some of the data that we've worked up in the past, that works out to about 3,000 um, because of how people usually connect with other backyard enthusiasts. And 4-H is, is really the, the vehicle and the mechanism for, for spreading, um, you know, information. So it's really important that 4-H that people, in my uh, mind, um, really start filling these things out because when we do have problems, it's a great way to kind of network with people. I remember when I started at UC Davis almost five years ago, four and a half years ago, something like that. Uh, when I started, we had this avian influenza outbreak in 2014, 2015. And I remember I got a phone call from someone in the poultry industry saying, can you send an email to all the backyard poultry producers in the state and tell them to keep their birds inside? And I said, I can talk to my neighbor down the street. That's about all I got. So now that, in my mind, that's a good, that's a good thing to say if when I'm just starting, but five years later, if I had that same answer, then you know, I, would, I, would, I would be critical of myself for that. So this is a way that we can communicate with, um, with people. And then the other thing we can do here is you can participate. This is the whole citizen science thing. Um, and this is great, I think, for 4-H type folks and other people that are interested. You guys can now um, participate in surveys that we have, studies we have. Um, Dr. Gallardo, one of his grad students has used this. We're using this for some um, antimicrobial resistance stuff, which I'll tell you guys about another time. Um, but I think it's a great way to be engaged with the university, with how research is done, and um, a, hopefully a great way for us to communicate and share um, the type of work that we're, that we're doing together. Um, the other thing I want to kind of mention, just very briefly, and then, and then we'll get back to on target, is um, there were obviously some devastating fires in California uh, this last fall, summer and fall. Um, so we did get a small amount of funds to study eggs from counties, uh, from backyard chickens raised in counties where we had those fires. Um, so if you or anyone you know um, is in those areas, in those counties, you can also go onto the website and you can look at this egg contamination testing page. Um, and those eggs can be sent to our lab and we're working with a toxicologist and we're mapping um, where those farms are. Um, in order that we can understand if those eggs are truly um, not, if they are affected or not affected by a lot of the particulate matter, a lot of the chemicals that might have been um, um, exposed to the environment and hence exposed to the chickens um, in California. And then the last thing we're doing is, um, this is a map of California. So California does some really great things as far as surveillance. Uh, they check the blood of children under six years old, not all of them, but children under six years old for lead, because um, we have lead in our environment for all kinds of reasons. The areas that are dark red are areas where we have um, people that, uh, children that have lead in their blood. Um, so we are going to concentrate in those areas and also collect eggs from um, people in those geographical areas to understand if we're actually seeing lead in, their, in, their, in, the, in the eggs that those um, backyard chickens are producing. So if you're interested in any of this, please contact me and I can kind of walk you through the submission process. Data will be shared with you, the, um, but it will not be shared with anyone else. Aggregated data will be shared with the, with the state and beyond, but no personal information will be um, shared. So anyway, just a couple commercials there. And
Uh, and then the last thing I'm going to mention is we have a, 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 a USDA grant um, to help beginning farmers and military veterans who are interested in farming. Um, so if people are interested in learning about um, commercial pastured poultry and free range production, uh, we have a three year grant to do uh, five workshops a year in California and Oregon uh, associated with those kind of beginning farmer type folks and military veterans because um, we all know the veterans unfortunately have higher um, unemployment rates than the rest of the population. So anyway, as uh, you guys get interested in these, please contact me. So um, disease transmission. So we talked about, we said at the beginning here, five minutes ago, we said, well, how does disease get on to, we talked about biosecurity. Biosecurity is basically preventing disease from getting to our chickens, right? That's just, that, that's kind of sort of what it is in a general sense. So here is our chicken, right? So how does disease get into that chicken? Well, insects and wildlife, right? So insects and wildlife can mechanically, um, they can carry disease or they can carry that disease as a, as a vector and get our chickens sick, right? So we need to protect our chickens as best as we can from insects and wildlife. What else do we need to, to protect them from? Well, they can get it from the environment. So um, if you go to, um, in, your, in your coop area, for example, um, there might be fecal material there from wild animals, and that uh, fecal material from that wild animal now is in the environment, and now it has, let's say, salmonella or E. coli or some of these other bacteria and viruses that we're afraid of. Um, so they can be exposed to the environment and get disease that way. They can get it from feed. So let's say we have uh, a feed bin, um, and uh, we have the, the top of it off, and we forgot to put the top on. Well, at night when we're not around, rodents are going to come in there. They're going to eat all that feed. The rodents are not like you and me. They're, they're not going to eat and then go to the bathroom somewhere else. They're going to go to the bathroom in the feed, and that's a great way for disease to spread. Um, the hatcheries, so um, even the best of hatcheries do have disease outbreaks, and they're sending chicks then all throughout the country. So when we do have an outbreak of disease from a hatchery, that could be really devastating because now that disease is spreading um, in, in, a, in a much more robust way. Um, however, there are some really great hatcheries to deal with, and Monica talked before, and Monica is my go-to person when it comes to the National Poultry Improvement Program. It is essential, as best as possible, that we always get our chicks from feed stores that are MPIP um, uh, approved. Um, that is fundamental. That doesn't mean that's perfect, but um, it, is, it is fundamental to, having, to getting healthy chicks um, that aren't going to um, um, hopefully um, carry disease. And I always wonder about hatcheries that aren't part of MPIP. You know, you wonder what shortcuts they're taking. Um, they're not getting that second pair of eyes from, um, you know, people who are really knowledgeable, including veterinarians who are going through those hatcheries. It is an essential part of, of having uh, a healthy flock. And unfortunately, um, a lot of backyarders aren't aware of MPIP. A lot of feed stores aren't aware of it. And the only time feed stores are going to start becoming 100% aware of it is when Owners say, look, those aren't MPIP um, uh, approved birds, so I'm, I'm going to go to a different feed store. So at, that is fundamental in my mind. Um, and then the litter. So we raise our birds on litter in California. We use rice holes. Um, some people use different types of uh, almond holes. Or the most important thing, though, is that um, that litter, if we don't keep good care of it, uh, the microbial ecology, the, the bacteria that are in that litter, um, can go, we can have good bacteria and we can have bad bacteria. And uh, if we have wildlife in there, um, if we're not having, if we have too many birds in a really uh, close confined area, um, the, the, the litter quality can deteriorate and uh, become much more um, likely to have disease causing organisms in it. And then fomites. So fomites again are a fancy word for kind of uh, in, in that, inanimate objects that can carry disease. So uh, can anyone tell me an example of a fomite that can carry disease? It's not living? A table, great. Yes, so powder on a table, for example, right? So uh, what else could be? What, on a farm, what are, what are one or two big fomite type? So vehicles, so vehicles could be a really good one. Uh, shoes are a really good one, okay? So we are mobile, we are humans, and we're going all over the world. So uh, Dr. Gaeta does work in Africa, I do work in Asia. And we're zooming across all over the world, all over the country, all over our own towns, going to a feed store. And most of us are in such a hurry where we're not thinking about it 
that we are wearing the same exact shoes um, than when we went to the feed store, than when we went home. And, and you guys are obviously starting to appreciate why we don't want to do that. Um, but that is fundamental. That's probably uh, one of the biggest issues, um, especially with the way the world works now, where you can literally be um, across the world whenever um, you desire. Um, and then workers. So uh, workers are, you know, we'll talk a little later about foot baths, but, um, you know, foot baths are these things that have disinfectants in them, and we put our shoes in them before we go into our barn. But if you go onto a farm, uh, sometimes you see these foot baths, and it is just like a sludgy mess in there. It uh, hasn't been changed for weeks. And then the people that are going through the foot baths, you would think they're like, you know, those football players that are kind of running through the um, obstacle course. I mean, they are going so fast through them that the contact time that they need uh, and the mechanical um, um, brush that's required to really get any, any junk off of the bottom of their shoes is, is not, is not, is not um, really leveraged at all. So um, it's really important when it comes to workers, and those workers are our parents, those workers are our children, um, those workers are anyone that's, that's working with those, with those poultry. It's really important that we make sure that they also understand um, you know, how, how disease is spread. Um, and then just really briefly, disease transmission into eggs, because a lot of us raise poultry for eggs. So there's two main ways that disease can get in, into eggs, especially I'm going to focus on Salmonella enteritidis, which is the most common Salmonella associated with foodborne illness. So uh, horizontal transmission, that's basically just saying poop gets on the outside of the egg, and then the egg is porous. So in uh, the egg, the salmonella then gets inside the egg. So that's horizontal transmission. That's the most common way that we think that disease is transmitted. But salmonella enteritidis can also be spread vertically, which is just a fancy way of saying the salmonella goes, is, is already in the egg before the egg is, 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 um, is, is laid. Um, that's less common, but it's important to realize that because if you are hatching your own uh, chicks and your chicks are positive for salmonella enteritidis, you cannot rule out that the, the hen that produced those chicks um, was also positive for salmonella enteritidis. So when you think about disease and biosecurity, when you find out from the CAFS diagnostic lab that your birds have, for example, mycoplasma or salmonella enteritidis, you need to start thinking, OK, is this disease vertically or horizontally transmitted? Because what's going to happen is you're going to say, OK, these birds have salmonella enteritidis. I don't want to have a food safety risk. We're going to depopulate this flock. And then you're going, to have, you're going to have new chicks from the same hens. And you know what's going to happen? If, it's ver if those hens were contaminated with salmonella enteritidis, those chicks from those hens are going to produce brand new chicks that also have salmonella enteritidis. So you're going to have to think about with each disease, is it vertically or horizontally transmitted? And when you get these, when your birds are sick and you submit the birds to the CAFS lab, the nice resources that you have is that now you can email me and you can say, hey, this is my CAFS report. These are the diseases I have. And you can email me, and I can talk to Dr. Gallardo, who's an expert in, in viruses. I can talk to you know, a whole host of people. Every once in a while, I'll know the answer. And then we can kind of work with you to give you suggestions on how to prevent um, that disease from coming back, hopefully. Um, so the big picture is that there are multiple hosts and multiple routes of infection. So I've done some work for some large farms. And uh, it's kind of interesting when uh, they have an outbreak of disease on there. Um, you know, everyone's looking for the smoking gun. You know, what, what was it that caused it? Was it the crow that came in or is it that gaping hole on the farm, you know, that's so obvious to people and, you know, CDC folks come out onto these farms and no one could figure out, you know, what happened, right? Because there was probably some anomalous event that's really hard to capture. But the reality is it's probably, it's got to be something like this, right? We just don't know what it is. And there's multiple hosts and multiple routes of infection. So um, biosecurity. So um, the point I kind of want to make here is uh, these are how do the, what gets actually onto the farm. Um, and, and when we talked about fomites, for example, when we talked about the environment, what's actually getting on there, and the reason we can't really see it very well is because these are, are microscopic. We're dealing with uh, bacteria. This is a, a, just an image of bacteria population on the tongue. Um, you can see the, the, you know, the, the millions, literally, of bacteria that we're carrying on our skin and in our mouth, uh, even billions of bacteria. We actually have more bacterial cells in our body than we do eukaryotic or human cells in our body. So we are, are more bacteria by number than we are human. Um, and then when we think about dust, you know, when you go onto someone's backyard um, flock and you see all this dust and dander there, realize that those are just surface areas that are covered with, with bacteria. 
99.99% of those bacteria are fine, right? We are symbiotic with them. They don't harm us. They don't help us. Um, they're just there. But um, pathogenic bacteria can be carried on, on, these type of, um, on this type of inanimate uh, material. Uh, yeah. So what is a pin prick? What does a pin look like? So when you look at um, a pin under a microscope, you know, the pin looks harmless. But just to show you again, you know, kind of the orders of magnitude here. So we're just looking at the tip of a pin and now just amplify that into a poultry environment as, as far as space and organic material and think about, you know, how much more um, we're actually dealing with. But here's the, the head of a pin. It's magnified 33 times. And then you can go all the way to 500 times, 1,000 times, and 5,000 times. And you can see that head of that pin, you can see literally the millions of bacteria that are on the head of that pin. Um, and that's not to scare you. That's just to, to make you aware that we're in a really um, robust, complex um, environment as far as all the, the things that are around us, all the bacteria, all the viruses that we're living with. Um, it's, it's pretty amazing when you think about it, um, that, that we're able to kind of coexist with, with all that um, material there. Uh, viruses, you know, we've all sat next to this guy in an airplane. Um, so this is, you know, obviously not a fun thing to deal with, but we've all been there. And, um, you know, it's always interesting that uh, when your flock gets sick and you're like, well, why did only five of my 13 birds have clinical signs of Merrick's disease when, in fact, most of the birds probably got exposed? Well, the reality is, is that like when you're on the airplane and this guy's sitting next to you and me, maybe I get sick and you don't, even though we both got exposed to it. So there is slight genetic differences. Um, we're both carriers for a while. Um, but the reality is, is that, um, is that, you know, aerosols are a great way to spread disease among, among other routes of disease. And aerosols can be uh, from, from birds, from wildlife, um, uh, et cetera. So, Biosecurity in, in poultry flocks. So we have uh, different types of control, uh, biological control. So uh, the main biological control that, that I want to mention here is vaccination. Um, for backyard flocks, 99 out of 100 times, I'm only going to recommend one vaccine, and that's the Merrick's disease vaccine. Um, so Merrick's disease is a herpes virus. I had a virology professor in vet school that said there are two things you can never get rid of. One are herpes viruses, and the other is land in Pullman, Washington. So, and then he told us he knows one of them from experience, but he wasn't going to tell us which one. So uh, the point is, is that um, uh, Merrick's disease is really complex. It's very, it's ubiquitous in poultry environments. Uh, vaccination is not perfect, but vaccination, in addition to biosecurity, um, in addition to good husbandry practices, is going to get you 99.9% .9 of where you need to go. Um, so vaccination is really, really important. We don't have all the vaccination tools um, and all the vaccination types that the commercial poultry industry has. Um, so that puts us at a disadvantage in the backyard environment. Um, but if you look at the data, the number one cause of mortality in backyard poultry in California is Merrick's disease. And I wouldn't even worry about what's second, third, and fourth. It is so much of a problem that if you can control Merrick's disease, you, probably, you can probably eliminate probably 70% of mortality in backyard chickens. It is insane how much Merrick's disease we have. In the commercial poultry industry, they control it because they're all vaccinated. So very rarely do we have Merrick's disease. Question? Oh, yeah. So the question is, what does Merrick's disease look like as far as like clinical signs? So that classic kind of, kind of picture is uh, a bird that's uh, basically down. It's unable to get to feed or to water. Um, it's kind of limping, basically. Um, because they get tumors, and those tumors can be in um, several areas, but one of the common places those tumors are is a sciatic nerve, so they can't move. So you'll see kind of them splayed with kind of splayed legs on the ground. So I'll get a phone call from owners typically that'll say, my chicken will not get up to get food and water. Um, and I, you know, I'm bottle feeding it now, and I'm bringing food and water to it, and that's kind of the classic sign, that they're hungry, but they're not going over there. Um, so that's the typical thing. There's other things you can see, changes in the eye. Um, you can see other tumors, but the most common kind of classical sign are, are those tumors um, in birds that are about below, probably between about eight and three months of age or so. Yeah, so it spreads um, via the feather dander. So the virus um, can be, it's ubiquitous. So if you have chickens, you have Merrick's disease virus, you've got that herpes virus in the environment, it's very difficult to disinfect and get rid of. 
but among other routes, um, it can be aerosolized, um, and it's present in the feather follicle. So if you have feather dander in your coop and you're bringing in new chicks um, or new birds into your coop, you want to make sure, A, that the feather dander is, is removed because now you've removed a bunch of the virus that's present in the environment. So you've decreased the load that's, uh, of the virus that's in the environment, and you want to make sure that those birds were vaccinated. And we can give a whole talk on Merrick's disease, but big picture, the birds need to be vaccinated either in ovo, when they're still developing in the, um, in the embryonic stage, or day one of age. So if you're giving Merrick's vaccines later than that, it's not going to hurt, but it's probably not going to help. Okay. Does that answer your question in a general sense? Okay, and on our website, we've got lots of good material also that kind of, kind of walk you through that and how to give the Merix vaccine. We've got a, a, a brochure on that. Um, so uh, other things, this is probably the most important one of all, like vaccination. Everyone wants to jump the vaccination because it's just human nature. We want to do something and we want to make it kind of fancy. But fencing is essential. Um, so we'll talk a little about fencing materials um, in a few more slides. Um, what I always, what I typically see when I go to backyards is that I, I see fencing that is in um, kind of one dimension. It's blocking me from going from here into the coop. Um, but obviously, wildlife um, can jump over and fly into and fly under, not fly underneath, but fly from, fly into a coop. So I think literally one or two times I've seen a completely enclosed coop um, where, the, where, where it would be more challenging for wildlife to get into a coop. So you have to think in three dimensions. So um, you have to think on the, on the top also, you need some kind of fencing, excuse me, or netting material. And then chemical. So um, foot baths, I have kind of mixed feelings about. Uh, for, in order for a foot bath to work, people have to use it, okay? So when you're in a rush to go feed your chickens or collect the eggs and then go to school and you just run around it or you run right through it, um, it's not really doing its job. And if you're like me, I, if I had backyard chickens, I, I would not change the foot bath daily like you need to. So if you are fastidious, and I will raise my hand and admit I am not fastidious, but if you are fastidious, then foot baths are great. If you are not fastidious, then foot baths are, are something that, that is probably more trouble than they're worth. Okay? And it's really interesting. I've seen these surveys where you ask people, they understand biosecurity. I mean, this is not kind of rocket science or brain surgery, right? This is just common sense. But the people that practice biosecurity, it's not based on knowledge, it's based on behavior. Are they fastidious people by nature? If you are one of those people that, you know, your stapler has to be in one little spot and, you know, you've got to have everything nice and clean, then get a foot bath. But if you're like me and, you know, your car has got you know, stuff all over it and your office is a big little mess, then I should probably, if I had backyard chickens, um, I would not get a foot bath. A foot bath. But the, the point is it really comes down to, to who you are and your personality, not even your knowledge level to a certain degree. Um, hand washing. Um, so just really briefly, uh, hand washing is obviously really important, but none of us, even the fastidious people, probably don't do it enough. So again, this is not rocket science, it's not brain surgery, and sometimes it's nice to hear things over and over again, like, okay, we need to have some kind, especially for children, um, we need to have some kind of um, dispenser um, that's close to the coop. So we, we encourage everyone, all the kids that are coming in, for example, to make sure their hands are clean when they're leaving. I've seen it happen where we had a, um, in the Davis Enterprise, on the front of the newspaper like a year ago, uh, there was a lady that had flip-flops on and the picture was of her holding her chicken in her dining room um, because she was afraid that her chickens needed to be indoors for some reason. So I had to write one of those love sandwiches to the Davis Enterprise where you say, wow, it's great, you got chickens, I love it, you know, that's, that's great, you're taking advantage of, you know, producing food and, and raising them. Um, but, you know, chickens can carry diseases, and the flip-flops and raising them in your dining room is probably not ideal. And then you give the other side of the love sandwich saying, you know, wow, keep up the good work, and hopefully that was well received. But, um, so, we have a question. Who currently, and there's no right or wrong answer, who currently uses these tools, yes or no? So I'm going to press this button. Okay, so who, so I guess it's yes if you use any of these, and B if you don't use any of them at all. And if you don't have backyard chickens, then it's probably a not, a, don't answer. So it's <laughs> All right, so I'll stop that, and then we'll show our results. A, so A is you're using them, great. So only... 
two people were not using um, any of those. So that's great. Good. OK, so uh, characteristics of a good biosecurity program. So being realistic. So my philosophy in life and in backyard chickens and everything in between is don't make perfect the enemy of good. Okay, so I think sometimes you hear these biosecurity talks and you're like, oh my God, like now I need to get all these vaccines and I need to get fencing and netting. If you can't get the netting, it's not the end of the world, right? The, just to start with the basics and do the best you can. Good is better than bad and good is better than not so good. So I, I know sometimes we know this, obviously, but this is a really important point to make. Do the best you can. Even the big commercial guys, there's a whole spectrum of good and bad amongst those guys. Um, and even the really good ones have problems. Okay, so don't don't be uh, don't be afraid of that. Um, being preventative. So uh, I think the only one of the only things I don't like about being a, a a veterinarian that focuses on poultry is like when someone calls and they've got mycoplasma or they've got uh, salmonella or whatever the disease Merix. 99 out of 100 times, there's nothing we can do. There's just no cure for Marix, right? There's, there's, if we have salmonella enteritidis, even if we could treat them with antibiotics, we probably wouldn't want to for various reasons because we're dealing with uh, foodborne pathogens and things like that. So my point is the, the, the most bang for your buck is going to be being preventative. Um, that is essential and, and also fundamental. So you need to kind of think in, in that way as opposed to oh, now we're dealing with infectious bronchitis, and last year we had infectious laryngotracheitis, and you know, these diseases will, will pop up. Um, those are more of a symptom. The cause is that you know, we have some biosecurity issues maybe, we have some husbandry issues maybe. Um, there's something else that's causing all these things to happen. So the disease is more the symptom. Um, we need to focus on being preventative, and being preventative is really what biosecurity and husbandry um, are, are really focused on. Um, it's different for every farm. So this is not a cookie cutter type thing. There's a lot of commonalities, but the reality is, is that uh, your backyard is going to be different than someone else's backyard. And what works on yours, as we go through some recommendations a little later on, you might look at some of the recommendations and be like, eh, that's not really an option. So for example, we're in the Central Valley. Uh, the Central Valley this time of year has a lot of waterfowl. Waterfowl are the main reservoir for avian influenza. So if you're in the Central Valley and you have backyard chickens and you've got a pond, let's say, that's close to your backyard, um, and what I mean by that is, you know, if you look at uh, ducks, for example, um, they'll move in about a, a four kilometer radius of wherever they're roosting. So remember they're roosting, they roost just like chickens, they're, they're resting, and then when they go out on their feeding flights, they'll go within a four kilometer area. So if you've got ponds, waterfowl like water, so they're going to be in that, in that bubble of area as, they, as they're kind of moving on their migratory route. In this part of California, we've got a lot of ponding, we have a lot of uh, wetlands, we have a lot of areas where these birds can roost and feed. We have a lot of corn farms, we have a lot of rice farms. Um, so the point is, is that you need to make sure if you have that type of environment that's around you, um, you need to be really aware of where you get your water from, if waterfowl are flying over, that they can transmit disease to your poultry, um, that waterfowl are gonna look for opportunities to feed. So you need to be really aware of that. And if you do, just out of curiosity, does anyone get their water from a pond for their drinking water? Does anyone irrigate with pond water? Okay, so why would I be concerned? Why should you be concerned about irrigating with pond water on your farm where you have backyard poultry? What's, what's in that water potentially? Feces? and disease, right? So I was talking to a farmer last week, smart guy, and he just realized when we were talking about water, because he's using that water for drinking water for his, for his birds, he just realized that he was actually irrigating his pasture with pond water that have waterfowl that are roosting there during the winter time. So he's basically just bringing all that disease onto his farm. And then the water itself, it's really important to make sure that water, because that water probably has all kinds of E. coli in them, probably some salmonella, whatever else in there. It's really important to make sure that water is clean. So you need to make sure that you're using uh, um, um, a bleach, uh, chloride, um, and you can measure it. You need to make sure water, that, 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 that water that's treated has between uh, 3 and 10 parts per million of, of chlorine in it. And you can go up to uh, 50 and even up to 100 parts per million as your birds get older. But it's really important to make sure your water's clean because if you have uh, any kind of water that has E. coli or is not 
clean, that's the quickest way and easiest way to transmit disease because they're just, they're, they're, they're eating it basically. They're drinking water that's got E. coli in it. And that's what this farmer was having some challenges with. Um, so different for every farm. So think about not just, my point is think about not just where your backyard is, but think about the bigger environment around you. What else is around you? Are there ponds around you? Are there other backyards around you that are people, maybe you're the fastidious one, and it's the two neighbors that are down the street that are not fastidious, and you know, you're concerned about disease transmission between those, between those folks. That neighbor always comes over and brings cookies over and then goes to see your backyard. You know, those are the things you need to think about, not just your little bubble, but the bigger bubble that's around you. Um, and then, you know, this is a hard one, it needs to be reviewed and enforced. So, um, you know, you need to kind of go over it. It's, it's really important to actually have a plan, to actually write down a plan, and especially for 4 H'ers. I would imagine that's probably a really good activity is to kind of think through. And it's actually kind of fun to poke holes in it. So give your plan, give your biosecurity plan, give that to someone else and, and, and kind of swap them and see where you can kind of poke holes in each other's biosecurity plan. There's nothing wrong with having those holes, but it's kind of a good exercise to see where there's weaknesses. Um, it's always nice to have that second set of eyes, third set of eyes, fourth set, fourth set of eyes. Sometimes you can do nothing about it. It's just an interesting thing. And sometimes you can be like, well, if we had this amount of money, we would do this. Um, but in order to, you know, kind of mitigate, you know, this issue that we can't get a net on top, um, we're going to put string across the top. Because if you put string across the top, like fishing line, uh, that fishing line um, is really scary for raptors, for example. So if we're dealing with predator issues, and let's say this is our backyard, let's say it's a 10 by 10 square or something like that, you can take a few pieces of fishing line and kind of crisscross it. Um, it's not a net, um, but that really scares and spooks off uh, a lot of predatory wildlife, especially uh, raptors. So think about plan Bs and, and have a plan and cross-check it with other folks. Um, so the big components of biosecurity is isolation. I, I know we want our birds to kind of have lots of room to roam around and, and free range and interface with all kinds of things, um, but we need to do it in a way that, that prevents them from interfacing with other wildlife, because the other wildlife are carrying diseases. Those other wildlife can be predatory. So I do a lot of, I do, we do a lot of work in our lab with um, free range and pastured poultry producers. The number one source of mortality on those farms is predatory wildlife. Okay, so they need to, to, they are aware that that's a challenge, um, but that's, that's an area that they need to, as, as best as they can, in, in the type of husbandry that they practice, they need to focus on isolation. Uh, traffic control, this is the thing where just, we just want to make sure that the people that are going to see our birds are the people that should be seeing our birds. So if you went to your neighbor's yard, um, you should not technically be touching any other birds for 24 hours. So you need that 24 hour buffer plus showering, um, plus some of the other controls we're gonna talk about as far as boots and uh, overalls, you need that buffer in order to help protect uh, disease transmission, to help break that, that cycle of disease transmission. You'll go onto some farms and it's 48 hours. You'll go onto some farms, it's a 72 hour buffer. I've gotta sign a document that says I haven't touched any birds for 72 hours. There are some farms I've been to, when you walk on the farm for really valuable stock, I'll walk on the farm, then I go into a room, I have to take all my clothes off, I take a shower, they give me um, clothes to put on, including um, hair nets and booties and boots and overalls. I go onto the farm, I do whatever my work is, then when I come off, all that goes in the trash, and then I put my clothes, then I shower, and then I put my clothes on again. Okay, so it's really strict on some of these farms, because some of the breeding stock is really valuable, and the last thing they want is, you know, someone having any remote possibility of disease transmission. The funny thing about that farm though, is that is in the middle of this plains in, in the state, kind of far away from here. And it was the day, one day when I was there, it was really windy and you just saw dust for miles and miles and miles blowing onto the farm. And I'm, you know, making sure that I've got no disease on me. And you're like, man, what is, whatever's 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 miles down that way is blowing right onto this farm. So hopefully there's no other farms there. But again, you do the best you can. They can't control that, right? Uh, cleaning and disinfection. Um, so the big thing I will say about this, everyone always calls me like they want to know what chemical to use. I had one guy that called me once, he had a flamethrower that he wanted to use on his ground and he, he kept coming back to the flamethrower because flamethrowers would be fun to use I would imagine, right? But the reality is, is just what we call dry cleaning is the most important thing to do. Getting rid of all that dust and dander, just using a, a rag and wiping down surfaces 
is 99% of what you want to do. You want to get rid of all that dust and dander because that's where a lot of viruses, a lot of bacteria can be carried. Um, the cleaning, you know, I'm, I'm going to be really boring and say bleach is your best friend, um, but make sure it's a dilute bleach solution. And I'm going to show some really interesting results from Dr. Gallardo on foot baths and bleach, um, which are, I think is really interesting and, and he could comment on in case I butcher in a, in a couple minutes. Um, so isolation. So I like this, this coop. It's, it's nice and um, everything's kind of squared off here. Uh, what do I not like about it? Um, there's this, this grass here could be considered arborage for uh, rodents, mice and rats, for example. So mice can, um, why would a mice want to get in there? Why would a mice, why would a mouse want to get in there? Um, maybe there's feed in there, maybe there's water in there, it's warm. Um, so when you have all this kind of protective arborage around there, that just gives them kind of a, a nice freeway to get in there. Um, so you want that, and it's, it's, there's a middle ground there. You know, if, if, if I was, if I put my commercial poultry hat on, I would, I, this would be a dirt pad right here, right? Because we just don't want any risk. There's no reason to have grass. But this is someone's backyard. You don't want a dirt pad there, right? So I would just make sure that the grass is clipped, you know, within like a half an inch or something like that. So there's a middle ground there, but that would be one issue um, that I would have. I like how the feeders and the waters are raised off the ground. Um, I don't like the straw. As a, as a bedding material. Straw is great for nest boxes, because the whole point, we doesn't want the egg to crack um, and have some of the problems that Dr. Blatchford explained earlier. Um, but the straw is not really absorbent, so it doesn't really, the whole point of having um, bedding material here is to have an area where the fecal material uh, basically gets absorbed and the ammonia smells are also kind of absorbed, so that's why rice holes are really good. Straw, if you chop really finely, can do that, but I'd rather just get, especially since we're in California, we can get rice holes relatively easily. I'd rather do that. Okay, so our next question. Are backyard birds free of contact with poultry pathogens? Yes or no? So I'm going to turn the timer on. So this is from a survey that Dr. Gallardo did with a master's student of his, who's actually uh, moved on to veterinary school. And um, it, this is interesting because we all know what the right answer should be, right? Um, but as we go through the survey, I think you're going to see what reality is and realize why this type of, of talk, why you might say, well, this is pretty simple stuff, why this type of talk is actually really important because why aren't people doing it if it's really obvious? Um, so we need to kind of address that. And here's just some, this is a, a survey from, from, from uh, Dr. Gallardo. And how many backyards were included in the survey approximately in California? 41 backyards in California. So, okay, thank you. So 41 um, individual premises representing over 500 backyard chickens. So do you use a lab or a veterinarian to diagnose mortality? Um, you know, only 37% of the people said yes. So the first time when people call me and they say, oh, I've got a sick bird or I've got these dead birds, what should I do? And I'm thinking about this vaccine and I'm going to um, you know, do this type of husbandry practice. My first question is, did you submit the birds to the CAFS lab? Because until we have that, we don't even know if we're dealing with an infectious disease. Maybe it's a nutritional problem. Maybe there's something else going on, right? So this is fundamental. In the old days, a couple years ago, you could submit birds to the CAFS lab for free. Now it's $20. Um, advantages and disadvantages to that, obviously. The program got a little too successful, um, so they're trying to create one little speed bump there. But what I would say is, for $20, you're literally, in some cases, getting thousands of dollars of diagnostic work done, done for you. The stuff that the CAFS lab will do, um, they'll do electron microscopy and virus isolation and PCR and all these other tests in order to figure out what's wrong with your bird. But if we don't know what's wrong with the bird, it's really hard to give you any advice. Yeah, so the question is, don't they limit it to two per household? It's, it's two per submission for $20, and then the next submission would be, again, $20, and then the next submission would be $20. For backyarders, you know, the average number, of, from our surveys, the average number of backyard poultry is six. So if you're making three submissions, I would tell someone on the third submission, you probably don't even have to submit because now you don't have any backyard chickens at that point. So the whole point of why you're submitting is to protect the rest of your flock, right? So... Um, Yep, so the question is how fresh do those chickens need to be? So we don't want you know, tissues that are necrosing or anything like that, or else the pathologist can't do their job. 
Um, and that's why we want the, the birds not sent on ice, but we want the birds next day aired and um, ice packs in there to keep the bird cool, like at a refrigeration temperature. Um, but, but yes, we want those birds, as they, the pathologists want those birds as quickly as possible so they can, they can do their job. As far as the date or? Well, here's where it gets challenging, because what if we're in the middle of the summer? If we're in the middle of summer, then it could be literally less than a day, because we're dealing with you know, insane temperatures sometimes in the valley. If it's this time of year, it could probably be out there for a couple of days, and probably not going to have such a, the fresher the better, correct. And they'll tell you. I mean, if they, if they can't do anything with it, they will, they will let you know. Um, so other parts of the survey, do you have any specific footwear for working around your chickens? So the answer is primarily, um, is primarily no. Most people don't have footwear, right? So that's huge. Um, you know, if you're gonna if you're gonna think about what's the low hanging fruit that you can um, that you can focus on in order to prevent disease transmission and encourage you know good uh, biosecurity, uh, having dedicated clothing is is, is going to be at the top of the list. So having a pair of rubber boots um, that you keep out near the coop or that you keep in an area that are going to be you know 100% dedicated to your coop along with a pair of overalls. I mean that that's not much. That doesn't take much to do. Um, but that is a really good thing to kind of separate yourself and, and make sure that you're, you're doing what you can to prevent disease transmission. Can wild birds enter your coop? So um, you see, like, again, you know, the majority of the answers are, are yes. And that's a really honest assessment from people. I, I'd be curious on those 12%, you know, if you went out there, um, if we could figure out a way for wild birds to enter that coop. I've gone on to commercial farms where wild birds can get in the coop. The one thing I will say is do not allow nesting behavior of wild birds in your coop. Because once you allow nesting, that shows that those birds now are, are established in there. They didn't just fly in there and fly out, right? They just got lucky. But if they're established in there, now you really have issues of disease transmission. Um, so it's really important, again, we need our own shoes. We need dedicated shoes that we keep on our farm in our backyard. Um, and we want to reduce that interaction, and not eliminate, but reduce as much as possible um, being pragmatic with wild birds in order to decrease um, the incidence of, of disease transmission. And I think what Dr. Gallardo is getting here on their surveys, so he did this really interesting study where they did surveys among these 40-something farms, um, and then they also took blood samples uh, to look at antibodies of uh, various respiratory viruses that those backyard chickens might have. If they have antibodies to mycoplasma, that means at some point they were exposed to mycoplasma. If they have antibodies to, um, you know, another, uh, to salmonella, then at some point they were exposed to salmonella. So what Dr. Gallardo's uh, grad student and what he figured out is that birds that were, or flocks that had exposure, that had antibodies to Newcastle disease virus and mycoplasma um, also had, um, interaction with wild birds. And that makes sense, right? Those connect with each other. The more, the, the, the worse biosecurity practices you have, the more we would expect those flocks to have antibodies to respiratory viruses that are potentially carried by uh, wild birds. So to summarize, so Dr. Geider is saying the same results are true with the footwear. Um, if, you, uh, if, you, if you were wearing protective footwear, then you were less likely statistically to have Mycoplasma galliceptacum, Mycoplasma synoviae, and Salmonella um, antibodies in your birds. So it makes sense. Okay, so what is the source of your birds? This was also included in the survey. So uh, can anyone tell me what are the, probably the good sources here of birds? What's, a, what's a potentially a good source of birds here? And we talked a little about this. We want to make sure that our birds, when, they, when we get our birds, that they're disease free. MPIP hatchery, right. Now, feed store, we have to ask Dr. Gallardo, does feed store imply that they are not MPIP hatchery, or we don't know? Maybe, maybe not. So maybe, maybe not, but that would be a good option, because a lot of feed stores work with MPIP, some don't. But which ones would be potentially the most risky? I would say the friend, and the friend, if my colors are not mixed up, the friend is, is, is a pretty big piece of the pie here. What about Craigslist? Is that a reputable place? But if you go on a Craigslist and you type in backyard chickens, oh my gosh, it's crazy, right? So um, that's a real problem. Now, a lot of people say, well, I've used Craigslist for, a year, never had a, for years and never had a problem. And that's fine, but you're, you know, you're, 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 there's risks associated with that, obviously. Um, and the other thing I would say is for people that hatch their own, um, a lot of people hatch their own or they work with friends because they want to deal with some very specific breed. 
I have no problems with that at all. Under those situations, that's a reasonable thing to do. But you just, in that situation, you just want to be really cautious about you know, how you're going to raise those birds and if those birds are actually going to interact with other, part, with other members of your flock. You want to make sure you quarantine them before they're introduced. Um, so again, um, you, know, you want to be practical. Um, so this is again from um, Dr. Gallardo's uh, master's student and his work. And I don't want you to get lost in all the details, um, but you can see, um, big picture, these are all different diseases. So avian influenza, infectious laryngeal tracheitis, et cetera. And you can see the prevalence of, the, um, of antibodies that those 500 birds had to various diseases. Um, and you can just see how high it is for all these diseases, for mycoplasma, for ORT, for Newcastle's, uh, for infectious bronchitis virus. It's, it's, really, um, it's really significant. Um, and that just tells you that these birds, maybe they're not sick right now, but they were exposed to these bacteria or viruses over their, over their lifetime. Um, that is extremely high. Okay, so the next thing he looked at is salmonella. So why is salmonella important? Some salmonellas make the birds sick and don't make us sick, right? So salmonella pylorum is a great example of that. Maybe like one or two people get sick a year from salmonella pylorum. There'd be some weird thing going on with their immune system if they did. Very rare if you look at uh, California Department of Public Health records and CDC data. Just doesn't happen. But we also have these other salmonellas that do affect humans. So that's salmonella enteritidis that we talked about, salmonella seftenberg, um, a couple other serotypes of salmonella. So there's these two kind of main flavors of salmonella. Um, these ones, in general, affect the birds, but don't affect us. These ones, in general, affect us, but don't affect the birds. So I've heard people say in the past, like, well, my bird doesn't have salmonella because it looks fine. Well, the reality is that bird could have salmonella enteritidis, and it'll look perfect, right? Um, so that's really important to be aware of. So uh, Dr. Gaiotter's lab did some work with that, and um, they went to these backyard flocks individually. And they tested the birds um, to see if they had the agglutination one. So that's the salmonella that affects, excuse me, that affects the bird that does not affect us. And what did they find? Well, they found that um, those salmonella, there wasn't as much of it as you would expect when you look at the birds. But then when you look at the flocks, um, the flocks were affected. So there's a difference between flock and bird. And the point, I think, and Dr. Gallardo can kind of confirm this, the point that I think he's trying to make is that it is prevalent at the flock level. There is a lot of salmonella that affects birds that's present um, in these backyard flocks. OK, so now this is the salmonella that makes you and I sick, right? So from a selfish perspective, we're really concerned about this. Um, so now the question is, well, how about at the, at the bird level, uh, we see very little salmonella enteritidis, so the type of salmonella that makes you and I sick. Uh, we see very little of it there. Um, but now when we look at the flock level, um, we see a little more. So 12% of backyard flocks in this survey uh, were, had, had an indication that they were positive for salmonella enteritidis. So that's concerning because there's a lot of backyard. We have, we have that 100,000 backyard premises throughout the state, and 12% of them um, have flocks that have been exposed to salmonella enteritidis and other salmonellas that make you and I sick. That, that's somewhat concerning. If you look at the commercial industry, the percentage is closer to 3% from, from work that we've done in the past. Um, so this is, a little, this is a little higher than I think we would, we would anticipate or expect. So um, kind of summarizing what Dr. Gallardo's survey and his master's student's survey, uh, um, kind of the results. When dedicated shoes are not used, there's an increase in the number of positive samples for salmonella antibodies. Um, so, the point is, is that you know, the stuff I'm telling you, you don't have to believe me, but we've got a lot of data, and this just confirms other data, that really shows if you're using, foot, if you're using boots, um, that they do, they do have a protective effect on whether or not your flock has been exposed to salmonella. And then the second thing, uh, rodents and wild birds' presence is associated with an increase in antibody detection. So People self-reported whether they found rodents or wild birds, and the people that self-reported that they did have rodents and wild birds on their, on their property, um, they were more likely to have antibodies, they are more likely to have birds that had previously been exposed to uh, the diseases that we talked about earlier. And then finally, birds obtained from the MPIP, from MPIP hatcheries, show less positives to both tests. Um, so that's because MPIP does its own surveillance. Um, so when you're getting birds 
uh, from MPIP uh, tested hatcheries, uh, you're getting a certain level of, of quality, a certain level of confidence that those birds um, are not carriers of various diseases, including salmonella. Okay, so our first question is, backyard flocks can be affected by respiratory diseases and salmonella. Okay, so now we're going to do the next one. Biosecurity education to backyard flock enthusiasts is needed. Okay, so um, just reiterating some of the basics. I, I'm not going to go through this, um, but there's a lot of stuff online. And the one thing I really want to highlight is um, um, you need to go to reputable sources when you're thinking about biosecurity. Uh, if, you lead that, if you read that uh, Chicken Fact or Poop book by um, Andy, uh, the Chicken Whisperer, um, he has, you know, whole things about um, kind of stuff that gets bandied about as far as what, what, what kind of cures things are. I can't believe how much you read about apple cider vinegar kind of fixing everything that chickens do and garlic powder or garlic and all these other things. So, um, you know, you have to go to reputable sources. If it's too good to be true, it's probably not true. Um, but just realize that extension resources are really good. Um, you know, Andy, to, to, to Chicken Whisperer's credit, he does a lot of stuff with academia. Um, it's not that we're always right, because we're wrong all the time, but um, we at least try to be science-based about it. So that's really important. Um, and then um, I think this is really interesting. So this is, again, some research by Dr. Gallardo. Um, so we talked a little about foot baths. So traditionally, when we think about foot baths, uh, we always basically put a disinfectant in, in, a, in solution in some kind of like a, a litter box for, for cats or something like that. We have our boots on and we go in there and we take a scrub brush and we scrub the bottom of our, our shoes um, and then we go into the, uh, into the coop. Um, so uh, Dr. Gallardo wanted to look at basically what types of foot baths people were using. Um, and you can see people are using different, uh, different ideas. Some were actually even using this dry disinfectant powder. Um, and uh, he wanted to basically look at, um, you know, how often are they taking care of their foot baths? We talked about having to change it every single day. Um, so you can imagine, you know, from some of the surveys, uh, the biggest piece of this pie is people weren't changing them at all. Um, so uh, you can also see these are among commercial producers, correct, Dr. Gallardo? Yeah, so these are among commercial producers. So these are the people that do this all day long, and they're still not uh, changing this when they should change it. And then you look at boot scrubbing. Are they doing boot scrubbing? So they're not doing that. So these are, you know, these are problems, obviously. Um, and I'm, I'm not going to go through all these results, but what Dr. Gallardo does is they, they, they took all the different foot bath uh, chemicals, uh, liquid and dry, and then they expose, they, they put them in this bedding, and then they, um, they put shoes on the bedding, and then they tried to see, okay, is the virus uh, is the avian influenza virus, did it, did it survive um, that interaction with the uh, different types of foot baths that they would use? Okay, quaternary ammonia, quaternary ammonia plus glutaraldehyde, bleach powder, control. No, so they did a control where they had nothing there. And the really interesting result is whether you're looking for a low pathogenic avian influenza or high pathogenic avian influenza, the bleach powder was the most effective. So before this study, I had never even known that people use bleach powder as a way to disinfect their shoes. So one thing that you could consider in the future is if you are going to use a foot bath, maybe consider using a foot bath that has bleach powder in it. Okay, so question. Are foot baths by itself the best measure to prevent diseases in our flock? Um, so that's perfect. So no, it's not. And, and we talked about why foot baths in a lot of ways are kind of like a crutch for people. They feel like if they've got the foot bath there, that that gives them like a force field around their coop and that they're fine. Okay, so next question is what measure will improve the effectiveness of foot baths? Correct disinfectant selection, frequent maintenance, boot scrubbing, asphalt or cement surface, or all of the above? And then after this, I want someone to answer why would having a cement or asphalt surface underneath your foot bath be important? <laughs> okay, good. See, actually, you, did, you answered it. I was like, oh, no, everyone's going to E. But that's a good thing. So that's the right answer. Good. Um, so why is having asphalt or cement underneath your foot bath as opposed to the chicken coop material, the substrate material there, a dirt pad? Why would that be ideal? Not porous, okay. Yes. Yeah, 
can you disinfect dirt? No. So it's really hard. You basically just disinfected your, 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 um, your boots, and then you just walked right out of there. And you're basically tracking dirt all around it. And they can just be a little dirtier and a little messier. Now, the reality is most backyards that you go to, um, it's really hard to obviously, even most commercial farms you go to don't have uh, asphalt or cement um, in every little area that you might want it to be. So you do the best you can. There we go. OK, so just really briefly, cleaning and disinfection. Um, again, I, I, I'm just going to mention the point. Really focus on the cleaning part. And that, what I mean by cleaning is just the dry cleaning. So really focus just on getting rid of dust and dander wherever you see it in the rafters. Um, the disinfection is great. You can use bleach. Um, you can use a quarter cup up to a half a cup per gallon of water of bleach. Um, just remember, if you are going to bleach any of these materials, uh, make sure the wood is not porous. Because once you start adding liquid into plywood and things like that, uh, not only can it be damaging, um, but you can create a microenvironment that can allow bacteria to persist. So um, you can use latex-based paints. You can use other sealers to make sure that wood is, is waterproof. But don't um, soak things with water that are not waterproof. Uh, pest control. Um, so I want to mention a couple things. Um, this is really fundamental. Now, a lot of people use chicken wire. Chicken wire is not very strong. So if you have raccoons um, and other wildlife that are strong, chicken wire, they'll ri literally rip right through it. Um, so I like this galvanized steel that is um, uh, much narrower and much stronger. It's called hardware cloth. Um, it's hard to work with, um, but it's much stronger. And you can see it's, it's, uh, the, the aperture, the, the, the diameter of the square is a lot, is a lot narrower. Um, it's also really important. Um, everyone has rodents, OK? So you want to prevent rodents from getting into your coop. So um, at the base where the uh, fence line meets the dirt, um, especially if you have dirt that rodents can potentially go underneath, um, it's really important to have gravel. Rodents don't like digging through gravel. So if you have a, up to six inches of gravel uh, in, the, in depth and in uh, horizontal distance around your coop, right at that line where the fence and the dirt pad meet each other, um, that is really helpful in controlling, um, in controlling rodents. I said six inches. That's a perfect world. So do the best you can. You know, if it's if it's a hard pad and you can't get six inches deep, um, go three inches deep. You know, you get the idea. Um, but this this type of material is really good. I will say uh, for predator control, there are a gazillion. You can give a whole talk on predator control. Um, these type of balloons that are shiny that wave around. Um, you can get coyote decoys. All these type of things. The reality is they don't work very well. Um, it's really challenging. And, and I've seen it where people, I've had farmers contacting me where they get those used car um, kind of sale, those guys that are kind of waving in the wind that are really big. I've seen farmers get those and spend thousands of dollars buying that from a used car dealer. And it lasted, it worked like half an hour before the Raptors were like, oh, that's just a you know, weird thing blowing around. Question in the back? Yeah, so the question was, is that um, they have a coop that's on steel, and rodents are still getting in there. Um, so in that situation, you don't need, excuse me, you don't need the gravel. Um, um, but the question is, well, rodents are still getting in there. What else can I do to prevent the rodents from getting in there? And that's where you start needing to util utilize bait stations. Um, and I'll have a slide about that. I think I've just got a couple more slides, but we'll talk about that in a couple more slides to answer your question. Um, so my point is about these, don't break your bank on these. Um, there's all kinds of, you know, when you go out to the vineyards and stuff like that, you'll see these kind of silver um, um, things kind of waving in the wind. It's better than nothing, but, but sometimes you have to deal with the predators that you have to deal with. The best thing you can do is, 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 is fencing. Okay, so um, we're going to break into groups of two just for a few minutes. Do we have a few more minutes or are we want to go for about five more minutes? Is that okay? Sorry. Um, so we're going to break into groups of two. I'm going to show you a picture, and you're going to try to find as many uh, violations as you can in the picture. So um, I'll give you about three minutes or so. Look really carefully. I know it's sometimes a little hard to kind of see all the minutia here, but um, hopefully we can, we can kind of um, identify a couple of problems. There literally are 10. Um, but we'll, we'll find as many as we can. But just look in all the detail and, and see what you guys can see.
OK. Does anyone want to identify a few things for the group? Yeah, there's some non-enclosed chickens. Like, if this is the barn, why are these chickens just out here? And that, that happens. I go to farms where that happens. But there should be people that are taking those. But that's definitely a, a risk. Yeah, so someone identified the cats, and the, the, the previous person identified the chickens that are, that are um, outside in the barns here. What else? Yep, the silo's open. Good job. So silo being open. Yeah, so we just talked about waterfowl. So someone was talking about the ducks and the geese over here. So why don't we want ducks and geese interfacing with poultry? What's the main disease? Avian influenza, right? So we definitely don't want that. The, the contradicting sign, so that's a, that's a good one. What else? The open gate, good. Okay, two questions. Yep, good job. That's a. <laughs> this? I don't know what that is. is it? Okay, probably shouldn't be there, yeah. But the dead chicken should definitely not be there, right? Right, that's good. Okay. Thank you. Anything, anything else? Okay, I'll take your word for it, but there's like a possum or some other wildlife underneath the silo. Probably because the silo door is open. What else? I see one other one. I'm sure we can find some others, but... Yeah, exactly, that truck. So remember we were talking about wheels. So what if this guy then's going to another barn right after this or another farm after that? He's doing a feed delivery or something like that. So now he's carrying fomites there. What about this stuff over here? Weeds, yeah. So you want to definitely have that cut down. Yep, yep. So these, 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 you're inviting the gates open, so you're inviting people in. There's what? Yeah, and the, the signs are, yep. And, and I can vouch for the fact that I've, everything you're describing, I have seen. Like, that, that's a, these are all somewhat common on some farms. Yep, exactly. So the, the, the grass, you're going to have, you're creating arborage now for rodents to get into the barn or to come over here. Um, yeah, so all kinds of, I think you've gotten kind of the idea. This is really common. Like, you know, farmers are really good at what they do, but you do see stuff like this. And it's, it's um, you guys are, are starting to get that discriminating eye. So it's really good. So in the interest of time, we, you know, you, I think you've nailed all of this. So I just want to kind of finish on this note, just talk about some practical biosecurity, and then, and then we can finish up. So this is just to summarize stuff, but obtain your chicks from a reputable source. Encourage the hatchery to vaccinate against um, Merrick's disease because you can only do so much with biosecurity. Uh, backyard farms are really challenging because you have birds there 24-7 all the time. You're not really having downtime. So you're going to have a lot of viruses that are in the environment all the time. Don't allow chickens to enter um, to your home as visitors. Um, you know, that's common sense, but I told you about that story on the front of the Davis Enterprise. Avoid commingling. So this one's a hard one. So commingling is basically... We don't want flocks of two different ages interfacing with each other. I've never been to a backyard farm where that doesn't happen. That happens everywhere, right? So what I would tell people is do the best you can. If you have flocks that are, why, why do we want to avoid that? Why would I prefer to have a, let's say, a 15-week-old a, a bird not interact with a two-year-old chicken? What's, what's, why would we not want that? Right, so from like a... So as, you, as you mentioned, from a behavior perspective, we probably don't want the older and younger bird interfacing with each other. There's challenges there with pecking orders. But how about from a disease perspective? What's the... Hmm? Yep. So to summarize, the, the older chickens, older chickens can be reservoirs of disease for younger chickens. So when I go onto a commercial poultry farm, with that information, am I going to go see the older chickens? If I, if I walk on a barn, if I walk into a, um, a property and there's 10 barns there, and the barn over to my right has the oldest birds, and the barn to my left, left has the youngest birds, do I go to my left first, or do I go to my right first? I go to the youngest birds first. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Thinking backwards. <laughs> thank you. So, but you get the idea. So that's the way you want to think about things. So that avoid that commingling. You know, do the best you can. Don't have more chickens than the ones you can handle. You know, that's a... Uh, um, 
important thing to think about, but hard sometimes for people to, to control themselves a little. We have the you know, crazy cat lady, and now we have the crazy chicken people now, but that's... <laughs> uh, use clothes specifically for working with chickens. This is the one that, to me, is really low-hanging fruit. It's really important. Uh, wash your hands thoroughly before and after working with chickens. Again, we all know that, but does everyone always do that? So it's really important to, to kind of um, focus on that, especially with young children. Every time you introduce new birds, quarantine them. So have them in a separate place for at least a week, at least 10 days, so you can see if they're carrying any disease. If there's a sniffle or they have diarrhea, you probably don't want those birds interacting with your birds. Question? Yeah, so the question is, as far as co-mingling, what if the young chickens that you're introducing to the flock are from the same hen or the same flock as the older hens were. So what would be the issue still? Disease, like what, do you have a, oh, so what if the older hen, the older chickens, they got exposed maybe to coccidiosis or infectious bronchitis or some other ectoparasite, those younger birds now haven't been exposed to, um, they were they were they were hatched from the same mom, but they haven't been ex they haven't been in the same exact environment. So you still wouldn't want that in that situation. So I would assess. So that that question is like, well, how do you know if the the birds that you're in, that are quarantined? How do you know if those birds are 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 truly healthy or not? I think over a ten day period, you want to kind of assess the general health of the bird. Um, if they're um, not bright alert and responsive, if they're not eating, if they're not drinking, those are the things that you really want to kind of key in on, not you know, some, some other issues that, are, that might not be as significant. Um, so wash your hands. Every time you, new inter you introduce new birds, quarantine them. Separate sick birds from healthy birds. How many people have sick pens? Good, nice. So the first thing, whenever anyone calls me, I say, where, where's the sick bird? Literally, I've had one person call me that said they had the bird in the sick pen. So. When you, when you notice sickness in your flock, isolate those birds because you want to protect the rest of your flock. Um, if sufficient land, rotate, um, rotate the birds to a, a new spot. So if, if this is your backyard, if you've got a big backyard like this, and your coop's over here, and you've got that fenced off in that corner, then six months later, move the coop over there, and then move it over there six months later. So, so let nature, sunlight, and things like that disinfect that area so you're just not building up uh, material there. Um, foot baths, we talked about them. Veterinarians are great, but um, veterinarians are, can be fomite carriers, so be aware that you know, your veterinarian needs to also be aware of disease transfer. There's nothing wrong with calling people out. I'm trying to encourage more small animal veterinarians to actually go out to farms as opposed to having the chickens come to the, to the veterinary office because there's so much that, you can be, uh, that can be learned by going to the, the backyard premise. Um, be meticulous and follow your bio, biosecurity plan. I haven't seen any biosecurity owners that have a true biosecurity plan, any backyard owners that have a true biosecurity plan. And then create an annual clean and disinfection time. Um, so last questions, and then um, you guys are free to go, aside from helping, hopefully, with the uh, exercise. Question? Yeah, so the question, if I can understand correctly, is that the, you've, you've got chicks that are being raised indoors for a couple weeks, and then they get integrated with the rest of the flock? Okay, so uh, what I would say to that is, first of all, you don't want, you don't want to bring any, any chickens because they can be carriers of salmonella into your house. So that would be one issue that I, that I would have with that. Um, but that quarantine length is more than appropriate, but could you do that in your garage? Could you do that in the backyard in a separate area? That would be my only kind of recommendation there. Thank you.